Hello everyone, welcome to the Luke Branquino Show. I hung up to a bull at a jackpot. He stumped me in the belly, broke all my ribs on my right side, lacerated my liver, bruised my kidneys, my spleen. They told me it'd be about eight months before I get on another bull and I told them they were crazy as hell. How did a guy walk in carrying his thumb <laughs> from team roping? This is Richmond's painting. I know I told you I was seven, but I look at the tag now and I was 11. It looks like something you would ride, Luke. My guest, J.B. Mooney, $7.4 million in career earnings in the PBR. This guy is not afraid of any bull they run under. J.B., thanks for joining us. You've had an amazing career, and in a lot of people's minds, the greatest bull rider that ever was. How do you put that into your own words? I think the real deciding factor where I really wanted to do this for a living, I was 18. Brian Canner, who used to, we traveled together everywhere, and. The old saying, it's not broke, don't fix it. So me and Cantor traveled, well, we won first and second everywhere we went. And he's six months younger than I was, so I turned 18 at the first of that year. I was gonna wait till he turned 18. We were both gonna buy our PBR permits, start going to PBRs. And I think a week before he turned 18, I hung up to a bull at a jackpot and Drug up underneath him, he stumped me in the belly, broke all my ribs on my right side, lacerated my liver, bruised my kidneys, my spleen. The hospital, they said I should have never made it out of the arena. And they told me it'd be about eight months before I get on another bull, and I told them they were crazy as hell. I was broke. I didn't have no money. Uh, had bills coming in, doctor bills. So I had the wonderful pleasure of having a job at a ball bearing plant. Inside, all day, covered in grease and oil from head to toe. and. After about, I don't know, three or four days of working there, my dad asked me, he said, how's that job going? I said, I'm gonna tell you one thing, they're gonna have hell throw me off when I go back to riding bulls. I can't do that shit the rest of my life. <laughs> I know we've always said, you know, being a professional cowboy, you're uh, too lazy to work and too scared to steal. And that's the only way we know how to make a living. That's it. And uh, that was kind of the turning point for me to where, you know, cause I, I mean, the surgeon told me it should have killed me when that bull stepped on me. She said, I shouldn't have got up and made it five feet. And I kind of turned the light bulb on. If I was going to do this, I better mean it. Yeah, put in that effort. And obviously your career has shown the effort you put into it. And going to Calgary and going to these other events where I got to watch you, there's such a huge difference between, you know, your pregame is what I like to call it compared to the other guys. I mean, those other guys are in the locker room wherever they're getting the ropes ready. And they're doing push-ups, they're doing stuff. Hell, you and I bullshitted outside Calgary. You're smoking a cigarette, warming your bull rope up. I mean, and but that's that's your mentality and that's what made you who you are and the winner you are. And it's just amazing to see the different uh, warm-ups that guys do. And I mean, that's just how you've been and keeps you cool and collected, right? I've always told myself, you never let them see you sweat. And I go about it different than other people. And that's what I try to tell everybody. I said, don't. Don't try it. Figure your own way out. Figure out what works for you, and that's what you stick with. And I said, me being laid back and not acting like I cared, I said, I care more about bull riding than most anything in this world. I said, I just don't show people that I do. And I said, the more I think about something, you think long, you think wrong. So I tried to keep it as simple as possible, and I, I always tell people, it's eight seconds. If you do it right every jump, they can't throw you <laughs> off. So. That's the way I went about it. I didn't really look ahead. I didn't really care what the bull did. And I acted like it was another normal day, you know, stand out there, keep my rope up, smoke a cigarette, you know, do whatever. Bullshit talk. session with whoever's around. Yeah. And when it was time to crawl off in the bug and shoot, once I got in that bug and shoot, it was game on. Man. Well, and I, like the conversations, I don't know we hadn't had very many, but talking to you, it wasn't about bull riding, it was about everything else going on, whether we were cussing somebody for doing some bullshit deal and and that's what I love about you you don't sugarcoat nothing if, if somebody did wrong you're gonna tell it to them and you're gonna let everybody else know too oh yeah you know I, I'm pretty straightforward what you see is what you get and uh, there have been a few people who didn't really like that a whole lot because they thought my opinion was didn't really meet their expectations but uh, you know all them guys like that's what somebody asked me I said you ever had growing troubles before this and I said no and uh, they said did you did you do you stretch a lot I said no I said, I stretched same time 
every bull I get on, they said, well, when's that? I said, the first jump. <laughs> I said, whatever's tight, them bulls snatch everything loose real quick. Going back to the bulls and watching you again through your career, you never did back off. You picked the rankest son of a bitch in the pen every time. And that's why I think, and I feel, people consider you the greatest of all time. That's what they've always said. And I, I told them I had to, when I hang that bull rope up, I want everybody to have the same outlook. Whether they say I'm the greatest or not, it really doesn't matter to me, but I want them to be able to say there was, I never had any backup. No matter what day it was, how old I was, how young I was, what was on the line, I never had any backup. Well, and, and you showed it riding bulls as you did. Guys would be scared to get on them. And when you got bucked off the first time, second time, third, you would try them. Eventually you conquered them. And you, tell me about some of those bulls that you did conquer because I don't have a list of all of them and I know there's many. Well, I think I've rode pretty much every world champion bucking bull till uh, I think Smooth Operator, I rode all those. Bushwhacker was probably the one that gets everybody. I, I attempted to ride him 13 times. I oh accomplished it once. That's kind of where you, you, you know, everybody said, well, don't you, don't you wish you would have went about it a little different? You probably would have won more. And I said, no, because I went about it the way I wanted to do it. And as long as I do that, then I can always keep my head up. And I said, I, I can always live with trying, but I can't, I can't live with thinking what if. You know, his uh, pride kind of got in my way then. Uh, they first cracked him out. When he was a young bull, they rode him once, I think. And then when he got, kind of to be bushwhacker they all the hype was around him they said oh he can't can't be rode you know all this and everything and i was like shit <laughs> so i pick him and first time i get on him i think about the bottom of the second jump he whacked me in the side of the head i flipped around his head flung me stomped the shit out of me i was like all right he's for real anytime i had the chance to pick him i picked him whether i said first tenth it didn't matter that's what i'd always tell them guys they'd say what are you picking jb it doesn't matter. I said, they're going to leave me what I want, no matter where I'm at. And there's nobody wanted to get on him. You know, if guys were sitting first, they were going to try to pick a bull they knew they could ride to win the event. I was the opposite side of the coin. I said, nobody remembers 85-point bull rides, so who wants to be 85? Let's be 95. And by far the smartest bucking bull I've ever been around. Not a mean bone in his body. Stood wherever you wanted him to in the bucking shoe. Could move him around. And out of 13 times, he never cut the same tracks twice. You had no idea what he was going to do when you nodded. And that means he's using his brain. Bruiser, great, great bucking bull. But you knew what he was going to do. Same thing every time. Round the left, jump way up in the air, backwards, back to the right. All you just had to do was make sure you were in the right spot. But Bushwhacker, there was no game plan. There was, there was a dog fight from the word go. Speaking of using your brain and me not using mine, Julio Moreno came to me when Bushwhacker was a calf. He said, hey Luke, give me $5,000, I'll get you in on this really good bull, I'm gonna call him Bushwhacker. And I'm like, ugh, broke rodeo cowboy trying to make a living. I'm like, I don't know if I have it right now, Julio. I really wish I would have had it at that time or figured out how to get it to be partners in that sucker because uh, that was an opportunity that slipped through my fingers. I've had a few of those run through my fingers myself. Jerome Davis and Brian Canner bought a little bull they called Super Freak. And I was sitting there with them the night they were buying him, bidding on him. And Jerome said, you want to split him three ways? I said, heck no. I said, he can't keep his feet. You know, he's just a yearling. They were bucking him with a dummy, but he fell down in every video. I said, he can't keep his feet. They buy him, bring him back, get him to North Carolina. And every time they bucked him at the ranch over there, he fell down. Well, Brian calls me one day. He said, hey, did you hear about my calf? I said, no. He said, he won the American Heritage, won 97,000. I was like, you've got to be shitting me. Now I try not to keep them around long enough to see if they're gonna fall down or not. I flip them pretty quick when I get them. Well, man, I appreciate you coming on. It's been completely awesome. I know everybody that's watching is gonna enjoy it, like to get your insight and uh, looking forward to seeing what's in the future for you. I appreciate it. You bet, man. Thanks again and good luck to you. Yes, sir, have a good one. My next guest is not only a professional in the rodeo industry, but he's also a good friend. Mike Rich 
Executive Director of the Justin Sports Medical Team. Mike, thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me. So we went back 2000, 2001, circuit finals in Del, Del, Del Mar. Mar. Cold, 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 yeah. cold. And I uh, had a steer let off pretty good, split my lip. First interaction I ever really had That's with Mike. That's the first one I had with you. You were young, you were baby brand queen. <laughs> baby brand queen, yeah, according to Bob Loomis. Point, yeah. You didn't stitch me up, he patched me up, and then the doctor went ahead and stitched Sewed me up. up. I mean, that was the start of, fortunately, unfortunately, a great 20 relationship. 20 years, 20 years of relationship. And there are so many steps along the way that we can get into, we wouldn't have enough time for them all. But this story, which I know you'll remember well, Billy Boog and I left Sheridan, Wyoming Friday night. We got a room in Casper. We ordered lunch, had it, and ordered dessert, and he had strawberry rhubarb pie. We I had know where you're no, going here. <laughs> we had no idea. <laughs> no. He was allergic, he was allergic to, to rhubarb. rhubarb. We caught a cab, pull in Casper Rodeo Ground. We're sitting by the rodeo office, and Jake Barnes is there, and I'm sitting there talking to Jake for, I uh, 10, 15 minutes, and every two, three minutes, Billy would come, Luke, I have a problem. I itch everywhere. I don't know what to do. I'm just itching. And I, it dawned on me. I'm like, well, what did you, why would make you itch? And I've heard people yeah. are allergic to it. I can't stand it. So I call Mike and I was like, hey, Mike, <laughs> how far out are you? Or is somebody going to be here? And you yeah. were a few hours out. I was a few hours out. Well, we had local people available. Yeah. yeah. Mike gives me the combination to the trailer, tells me where <laughs> yes. the needle Epi syringe and the <laughs> EpiPen is. Billy was having an allergic yes. reaction. He was not in a good place. But you did well. You you're a diabetic. You yeah, I know how to handle it. Someone. Cade Swore was pulling in at the time, and so we jump in his trailer, he parks. I have the video because I share it with people often. <laughs> oh my God. Billy has his pants down, looking out the trailer door. It took me five minutes to give him the shot because we were laughing so hard. And he's like, ah, oh, Luke, just do it, just, just do stick it. me. That's probably one of the fondest that rodeo memories I have. That is priceless. Now, what do you see as far as injuries compared to rodeo, to football, to golf? I mean, similarities, but not so much? No, not so much, Luke. I've traveled with ATP tennis. I've traveled with PGA. I've traveled with NASCAR, IndyCar, whatever. What it boils down to, I did a rodeo in Tucson, Arizona, probably 15 years ago. And the company I worked for wanted me to help with the golf tour at the same time in Tucson. So I go to the golf tour and this guy comes in the trailer and he's like, I got a blister. I'm like, I am not seeing it. <laughs> And he's like, no, I got a blister right here. I'm like, okay, you want me to tape it? I'll tape it, but I'm not seeing a blister. That very evening when I went to the Tucson Rodeo, had a guy walk in carrying his thumb <laughs> from team roping. And I'm like, I need to be done with these other sports. <laughs> I will take the guy with his thumb in his other hand, like, here, Mike, here's my thumb. And you grew up with it. That's the cowboy I did. mentality. I grew up on a ranch. The Justin Sports Medicine team, they take their trailers to the rodeos. You guys choose which rodeos you want to go yeah. to. And it's a pretty much full medical staff in there, correct? It is. We carry a bunch of things. And trailer wise, when people talk to me about rodeos, we have a waiting list. This year, 2022, I covered 136 rodeos. Wow. And it's not cheap. But at the same time, we do the best we can. We go to the biggest rodeo we can because you can tell me as a competitor, if they have more added money, you're going to go. Correct. So that's what I got to look at. So we be where we can be to help the most people. Well, and to help the most people, they do. I mean, I can't tell you how many times a guy rolls an ankle, breaks a wrist. I, I can remember... Uh, was it Logandale, Nevada? Yeah. I was uh, ran a steer, steer stepped on my back, dislocated my left shoulder, and Rowdy McGee, Rowdy McGee. put my yep. shoulder in right then. That's yep. the type of service that you receive as a cowboy when they're they're around, and, it, and it's amazing. And what drove you to rodeo? I know you growing up in Kansas, you were around it your whole life. I was around it my whole life, and I thought I was going to be a rodeo guy, and I always blamed it on horseback, right. like everyone else does. So uh, my dad said, go to college, take your at track scholarship, basketball scholarship, do it, give it four years, get a degree, and then come home and I'll, I'll buy you a better horse. Well, I never came home to buy a better horse because I feel there's a lot easier ways to make a living, Luke, than yeah. what you did, <laughs> to be honest. So, oh, very true, very yeah, true. And, you, just... and you've witnessed it. You've witnessed guys like me that had fortunate and was successful and made a living, but you've witnessed probably 10 times more than that that struggled to put food just, on the table for their family. Yeah, exactly. And the difference is, like, the reason, like, I travel with pro tennis, I travel with golf, I travel with NASCAR, IndyCar, like, all these people medically, 
The reason I gravitate back to Rodeo is people like you. Like you will do anything you can to put food on the table. Because of you guys, I was able to do that. I mean, I could make a list of things. From 2014, when I tore my lat at Salinas, Rick yeah. diagnosed yeah. it, went and got an MRI. I sent it to Tandy. I went to three different doctors, and they're all saying eight months. I'm like, well, the NFR's in four and a half. That, ain't, that shit ain't gonna work. Yeah. I have a great relationship with Tandy. He's gonna do what's best for the cowboy. He is. He knows, hey, I can't fix it. I will send you to who can. He sent me down to Savoy, down in New Orleans. Put me back together, and while I was recovering, Covering a couple days after I got a hold of you, yep. you sent me a laser machine, you sent me an ice machine. Four and a half months later, I ran my first year at the national finals and won my fifth world championship. Yes. And I mean, there's so many more that I could talk but, about. Like, I remember ripping skin off your cap. That's right. When you blew your Achilles at the NFR. We taped that every night because every it happened night, in the second and night. And your skin was raw and <laughs> shit. Yeah. But tape. you know what? You probably won what? 60th thou that week? I'm not sure what year it was, but yeah, I won price close you to 70 did well. or 80. That was another world champ. I would still do it to this day if I was entered. We'd show up to the rodeo. Hell, I'd come hang out with you guys in you the would trailer. You sit in the trailer. And Usually then, it was hot and they had the air conditioner on, which was a big deal. Yeah, but you were doing it for being a groupie type oh, guy yeah. at that point. <laughs> but yeah, you'd come sit in an air conditioned trailer and then drop trowel, put your knee brace yep. on. Leave your kid with me in the early that's days. That's right, yeah. that's right. I would babysit Luke's kid. <laughs> so don't make him think like he's all this in a uh, bag of chips. I hope that no other athlete, contestant, cowboys have to do what I did with the Justin Force Medicine program. But I know if they did, you guys would be there for him. Luke is one of those one in a million. He's had so many injuries, but the difference between Luke and a lot of rodeo contestants is he does what we tell him to do. If I can make an impression here with rodeo people, just listen to sound advice. Right. You did. For good reason, because I wanted to keep going. I wanted to keep being successful. I wanted to be able to provide for my family. But the people that work with me with Rodeo Luke, they get what you do. There's a couple 300, 800 people out there in the world that do it for a living like you did. And if you can't compete, you can't pay your bills. You have no income. But then there's another 300 people that it's a weekend deal yeah. for them. Those people, I can be honest with saying, you know what, go home, give it time, heal right, and then go again. But you as as the professional in that, you have to be able to justify saying that to a Luke Branquino or a circuit guy and know that hopefully you don't piss them off. Which I have pissed a lot of people off, but you know that, <laughs> oh, I yeah. pissed you off. You've never pissed me off. Yes, I have. I've been nah. too honest with you and you've well, been mad. That's true. Luke can be a fucking baby. <laughs> oh, I can a little bit, yes, he's right. As you can tell, Luke and I go way back, like we really do. <laughs> And if you guys ever want to bring me back in the studio without him, <laughs> I can tell you stuff. Some stories. He will not want to know. Again, I can't thank you enough and the Justin Sports Medicine team. And as a contestant and an athlete, I think I speak for everybody out there how much we appreciate what you guys do. So thank, thank you. you for that. And I appreciate you coming on and hopefully look forward to having you back again. No, love to be back. We now have joining us Richmond Champion, a good friend of mine. The man won a million dollars at the American, the very first American. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me, Luke. Richmond, your season got cut short, which was heartbreaking for me to hear. Uh, what do you got going on? What did you have done? And you know, what's the future look like? Yeah, I'd kind of just the end of last season been really tight in my traps, and you know, I'd, my hands would just kind of go asleep. And I was at San Antonio, and I went into the sports med. I failed a bunch of nerve tests. I couldn't put my thumb and my pinky together, and you know they were pretty adamant about me getting an MRI whenever I got home. So he called me like three hours after I got it and told me I was grounded and I need to come to Texas and have surgery and the season's over. For your event, you guys get the shit beat out of you. Even on a good ride, you know, I've talked to Casey about it. You're still pretty damn sore uh, when you get done. And the challenges of that and trying to keep yourself healthy, and one thing I've noticed in the last Oh, I've been rodeoing, what, 20 years, and I had the luxury of riding with Larry Sandvik. He caught a ride from Bremerton, Washington to San Juan Capistrano with us, and old Larry, he stayed in the living quarters while we drove to the house, and Billy Bouganig, guy I was rodeoing with, he wanted to practice, so we stopped in at the house, and Larry had got a 24-pack when we left Bremerton, and I think he finished, it took us 14 hours, and 
we're tired, we unload horses, and he pulls out stumbling, we start bulldogging, but how he, you know, tried to keep himself in shape and how you guys try to keep yourselves in shape is completely different. And in the industry, you have to be that way or you're not competitive. 100%, uh, I think it was 2015, I'd noticed it uh, the first time, just how many guys were training uh, in the off time, uh, worrying more about their diet, hitting the gym, and you stop seeing the the beer stand get filled up with bareback riders, uh, it seems like. And uh, I think it's done wonders for our sport. You have to want that drive and have that drive or you're just not gonna be competitive. And and not only in the bareback riding, but shoot, the steer wrestlers are, are really starting to take onto that trend. I think that's one reason why I'm thinking about retiring. <laughs> it's pretty cool to see how how everyone's taking kind of a more professional uh, step towards rodeo. And I, I think it really does make a difference uh, in performance for every event, whether even barrel racing, like being strong in the right places to do these events well and protect yourself because there's danger in every single event and keep people going longer and, and feeling better. It was funny, last time we went and ate with you and Paige, I think you guys might have shared dinner. You know, steer wrestlers, <laughs> mm -mm, we don't do that. No, you get your own shit, I'm gonna get mine. I'm gonna eat my dinner and I'll probably eat some of yours, Lindsay, okay? Just <laughs> don't send it away. Again, looking forward to next year. When are you released? When are you gonna get back on? What's, uh, what are things gonna look like? October, I should be released to kind of live life however I want, train full on. Should be back for Denver is my goal. Um, if I can come back to you know, one of the Chase Hawks or the Buck and Ball right around New Year's, I will, but I'm, you know, at that point, what's you know what's another month gonna hurt so uh, we'll just kind of play by ear and i've got a really good team of doctors looking looking after me so i'm on vacation i'm <laughs> <laughs> i'm in no hurry i'm watching the cowboy channel and going fishing well richie thank you again for joining us and next year we're looking forward to you coming back strong and dominant like you always are thanks luke i'm looking forward to it